Hi, everybody. I am Savannah Agardi, the Compliance Archaeologist here at the Utah State Historic Preservation Office. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about something that's a little more broad than Utah and Utah's heritage, which is world heritage. What is world heritage? Well, world heritage is heritage that is international or universal in significance and value. There are two different types of heritage, tangible heritage and intangible heritage. Tangible heritage includes things such as archaeology, architecture, and natural wonders. Intangible heritage includes heritage that is a little more obscure, so cultural traditions, traditional cuisines, and oral traditions. These are all good examples of intangible heritage. Everyone around this globe has a stake in world heritage, therefore it belongs to everybody. In the figures here, we have some examples of world heritage, some of which I'm sure you recognize. The pyramids of Giza in Egypt and Stonehenge in the UK are both great examples of tangible world heritage, that is archaeology that you can touch. In the center, however, we have an example of a Japanese folk tradition, which is intangible heritage. How is world heritage recognized and protected? These things generally happen through two avenues, regulation through international treaties, such as the 1970 UNESCO World Heritage Convention, and management and designation through international organizations, such as UNESCO, which is the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, ECOMOS, which is the International Council on Monuments and Sites, IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, ICROM, which is the International Center for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, and ICOM, which is the International Council on Museums. This figure here is a blue shield symbol from the 1954 Hague Convention, representing protected cultural heritage, which we'll discuss in greater detail in a few minutes. World heritage is mainly managed by international organizations. Essentially, the bread and butter of world heritage is UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. UNESCO does a lot of things other than managing cultural heritage, but today we're just going to focus on the cultural heritage sector, particularly the UNESCO list of world heritage sites. The UNESCO list of world heritage sites is an official inter international list of heritage places that have outstanding universal value. This is essentially the international equivalent to the U.S. National Register of Historic Places, something we frequently work with here at the Utah SHPO. UNESCO designates new World Heritage Sites each year. Here are two examples of World Heritage Sites designated in 2019, the left being the 20th century architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright, and that is the Guggenheim. In 2018, Trump left UNESCO, so the U.S. is no longer part of the organization. This means that we can still get World Heritage designations like the Frank Lloyd Wright sites, but we have less of an opportunity to be involved in the processes and management of UNESCO. This is not the first time the U.S. has left UNESCO. We left UNESCO in the 1980s under President Reagan, and we were joined in the early 2000s under President Bush. It is likely that we'll probably rejoin UNESCO again at some point. Even as a non-member of UNESCO, the U.S. National Park Service serves as the U.S.'s main liaison to the international organization. The picture on the right here represents a 2019 natural heritage designation, the migratory bird sanctuaries along the coast of the Yellow Sea Bohai in the Gulf of China. It is important to recognize that heritage is not just cultural, it also includes natural heritage, such as this bird sanctuary in China or Yellowstone National Park in the U.S. ECOMOS is another international heritage organization. Um, it's a non-governmental organization that is dedicated to the conservation and protection of cultural heritage sites and monuments around the world. ECOMOS also serves as an advisory body to the World Heritage Committee, as well as evaluating UNESCO World Heritage Site nominations, particularly analyzing their outstanding universal value. ECOMOS has a US branch, which is located in Washington, DC. US ECOMOS, has an international exchange program and also internship opportunities for people who are interested in careers in heritage. UNESCO and ICOMOS are the two most major international heritage organizations, but there are many others that specialize in natural heritage museums and the protection of cultural property. Apart from world heritage organizations, world heritage is regulated through international conventions or treaties. International conventions are international treaties in and of themselves which basically means that they're a form of international law. These conventions were all led by UNESCO and are sometimes referred to as UNESCO conventions. Here are some of the most pertinent international conventions related to world heritage, such as the 1954 Hague Convention on the Protection of Cultural Property in the Event of Armed Conflict. 
which is conducted in response to the horrific damage to the cultural heritage that occurred in, occurred in World War I. It basically sets international standards for the protection of cultural heritage during wartime, including provisions for deliberately avoiding, destroying, or impacting historic sites unless it's absolutely prudent to a military mission. Here on the right is a blue shield symbol, which is an international symbol from the convention that marks historic sites that are protected under this treaty. Despite the efforts of this convention, the destruction of cultural heritage uh, was even more horrific and extensive in World War II than World War I, especially in regards to the Nazi looting and intentional destruction of works of art. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. The 1970 Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export, and Transfer of Ownership of Cultural Property aims to protect cultural heritage from the illicit trade and black market networks that occur around the world. Unfortunately, due to private property rights and the lack of import restrictions in the US, the US is actually a hotspot for stolen cultural property, especially in Manhattan where there are wealthy art dealers and collectors. The Metropolitan Museum of Art has been a target of many of the cases surrounding stolen cultural property in the past couple decades. Nevertheless, this convention sets international standards on preventing the black market trade. A symbol here uh, to the right is the symbol that represents convention um, and it's supposed to represent the stopping of the cultural heritage trade. In 1972, the World Heritage Convention occurred, which set international baselines for the world heritage, um, especially officially recognizing natural heritage as a part from world or cultural heritage. The World Heritage Convention, convention also established the World Heritage Committee that is responsible for implementing the World Heritage Convention. The 2001 Convention on Underwater Cultural Heritage set international standards and recognition for underwater cultural heritage. And the 2003 Convention on Intangible Heritage broadened UNESCO's scope on intangible heritage, including the creation of an equivalent to the UNESCO World Heritage Site list called the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage List. Despite the standards and rules sent by international convention, it doesn't quite mean that convention provisions are law in every country. Even if a country is a state party to a convention, they have to have the convention ratified into their own law and legal system for anything to be legally enforceable. For example, even though the US is a state party to the 1970 convention on the means of prohibiting and preventing the illicit import, export, and transfer of ownership of cultural property, the convention was not law in the US until it was ratified into our legal system in 1983 with the Convention of Cultural Property Implementation Act. In 2008, the US finally ratified the 1954 Hague Convention on the Protection of Cultural Property During Armed Conflict some 60 years after the convention itself occurred. Despite the numerous conventions regulating and protecting world heritage, there are still impacts of world heritage that can occur even today. As discussed in the last few minutes, the 1954 Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property During Armed Conflict hasn't been as effective as it could potentially be. Enacted after World War I, the Hague Convention didn't have much standing in preventing looting and destruction in World War II. Here we have a picture of the damage in Dresden, Germany during World War II that caused irreparable loss to the historic German architecture. Um, and on the right, we have an example of the extensive looting the Nazis conducted during World War II, particularly with works of art. According to the Washington Post, the Nazis looted somewhere around 600,000 works of art from Jewish people, 100,000 of which are still missing today. People have noted that this art is the last remaining victim of World War II and the works of art are still being found today all around the world. In 2004, a piece of art looted from World War, in World War II from the von Nazis uh, was actually found right here in Salt Lake City at the Utah Museum of Fine Art, um, which was subsequently repatriated back to its country of origin. More recently, terrorist groups such as ISIS have caused substantial intentional damage to cultural heritage sites in the Middle East. Um, on the left is a picture depicting the intentional destruction of Timbuktu, a World Heritage Site in Mali, uh, which we'll talk about more in depth in a minute. And on the um, right is a before and after picture of the Bayman Buddhas in Afghanistan, which were blown up by ISIS in 2015. Here's a short video clip of ISIS destroying a heritage site. Apologies if this is a little harsh or depressing. Uh, however, it is the reality of the world and a good example of the types of threats that cultural heritage faces. 
Islamic State extremists have again taken to the internet in a show of force in Iraq. A new militant video purportedly from the group shows members destroying a historic archaeological site, the ancient city of Hatra, about 70 miles southwest of Mosul. The footage released overnight Friday shows militants using picks and sledgehammers to chop away at sculptures. One fires a rifle at the ancient relics. The Islamic State group holds a third of Iraq and neighboring Syria. The video's release comes just after the Iraqi government claimed victory over the Islamic State group in the city of Tikrit. Ed Donahue, The Associated Press. There is a small glimmer of hope in relation to this type of destruction, however. Ahmed al Fahi al Mahdi, who led a local ISIS sect in North Africa, was responsible for the intentional destruction of Timbuktu, a World Heritage Site in Mali. He was tried in an international criminal court for war crimes against cultural heritage, so basically breaking the 1954 Hague Convention. In 2017, he was found guilty on all war crime counts and sentenced to nine years in prison. Other threats to cultural heritage include climate change. Here we have a picture of the 2019 destructive wildfires in the Amazon, the location of several natural world heritage sites. On the right is an example of sea level rise and flooding in the city of Venice, which is also a world heritage site that occurred in 2019. Switching to a more local lens, there's also threats to Utah's cultural heritage, including vandalism and looting. Here we have an example of vandalism to rock, a rock imagery site and the illegal looting of a buried archaeological site in Utah. Utah is also home to the largest looted archaeological collection in the country. Therefore, Utah's heritage is also distinctly under threat, along with world heritage. These threats and impacts to cultural heritage, despite protections at the international, national, and local levels, really show the importance of preservation and conservation of heritage. If you want to get involved with protecting heritage in Utah's past, you can become a part of the Utah Public Archaeology Network, which is housed right here at the Utah SHPO, and visit the Respect to Protect Campaign's website, which is an educational campaign that is led by Tread Lightly and the Bureau of Land Management. By getting involved at the local level, you can help protect heritage sites not only in Utah, but around the world, so heritage is preserved for both us and for future generations. That is all I have for you today. Make sure you turn into the next virtual education and self-isolation Facebook event, which will be next Tuesday at noon. Thanks, everybody.